let you know that we are now recording on Zoom as well as Facebook Live. So I just wanted to give a brief introduction. Um, I just wanna say welcome to everybody um, to our first Sunday sketch of the year with the brilliant artist, Suzanne Lago Arthur. Thank you. Um, if you don't recognize me, I am the new Clarice and Robert H. Smith Education Coordinator here at the National Sporting Library and Museum in Middleburg, Virginia. A few housekeeping things, firstly, um, Generally throughout uh, throughout this, we generally want to keep our audios off only to reduce reverberation. Of course, if you would like to ask a question, please feel free to take out yourself off audio, um, ask questions, ask or make comments, things like that. I will also be monitoring the chat. So if you have, if you'd rather type your question, um, please do that, and then I can ask it for you. Um, Lastly, there is a downloadable image for the activity on our website on the event page um, of John M's Fox Hounds and a Terrier in a Stable Interior. Um, if you don't have it in front of you, I will place that link in the chat so that you all have access to it. Um, but otherwise, I think we can go ahead and get started and I'll hand it over to Suzanne. Um, um, thank you, Emily. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. I am a local artist. I live in Luckett, Virginia, as I think I said earlier. Uh, and I went to, I'm a local girl, went to the Corcoran School of Art. So I have a BFA from there and also a master's degree in museum studies. Um, so this intersection of art and the museum environment is really my happy place. So I'm thrilled to be able to uh, host this Sunday sketch with you all today. And the subject we're going to talk about today is um, uh, John M's Foxhounds and a Terrier in a Stable Interior, uh, which was painted in 1878. Um, John is uh, John M's was uh, English, born in Norfolk in 1844. He died on November 1st, 1912. He's the son of the artist Henry Wilson M's. So I love to do a little background sketch just to kind of understand uh, the place in history of, of where the artist is working. And um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share right now. We do have, I think we have a chat there. Um, if you want to see that, Emily. Um, Emily's going to be monitoring the chats for me because I won't really be able to see that at the same time. Yes, I will be monitoring the Facebook Live and the Zoom chats. Um, so hopefully you all can see, can you see what, what I'm sharing now, the image? Yes, okay, perfect. So this this will all go away. Hopefully the bars will go away very soon. <laughs> Let's uh, give it a second. But um, this is this is the, the painting that we're going to be looking at today. And it is, you know, I think Emily can concur. This is probably one of the gems of the collection. It's definitely something that the museum is well known for. Uh, and I absolutely love it. It's a very impressive painting. It's 39 inches by 52 inches. And 52 inches is just shy of um, five feet. So that's really, really big and impressive. It's oil on canvas. Um, and I want, this is a part where I kind of would like to open this up to people uh, to tell me what, what draws you into this painting. Is there something that's speaking to you in particular? I'd love to hear. So please unmute yourself and come forward. I I visited the museum the other day and I even bought the postcard of the painting because I loved it. I love the expressions in the dog's faces. Oh, fantastic. Are there any ones in particular that are drawing you in, Celia? I like the one all the way to the right. Okay. And also the one in the back that is standing that looks sleepy. I like those two. So this this guy here and this guy. Yes. Okay, great. I I that's wonderful. That's right on track with what I'm thinking. Um, does anybody else have any thoughts here about the work? I just love dogs, so <laughs> you know <laughs> Jane that. Does. <laughs> Jane takes care of my. Um, I have a great Dane. So Jane uh, Jane is my wonderful go to person for. Uh, uh, taking care of our dogs. So she's fabulous with dogs. So that's that's great, Jane, that you're here, actually. Um, I, there's nothing that's in particular drawing you in, Jane, as far as the painting? Are there any dogs in particular? Most definitely the expressions. Yes, exactly. They all have, it's not, they're all doing something. It's like, you look in a mirror, it's like, what's this one thinking? What's that one thinking? Because, you know, yeah. I talk to the dogs. So I, I just love it. <laughs> I think probably my, so the one that looks most like my naughty dog is the one that's in the middle to the left with his head. It looks like a Jack Russell. This one, the terrier. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, so I know what that one's thinking because I have one of those, but my favorite has to be the one in the back in the middle. I just love that expression. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. It's really, it's really great hearing uh, your input, uh, 
all of you guys your insight. Um, I love this terrier. It, it has it's just a very elegant arch here. Um, but we'll get into that a little bit more. Are there any comments in the chat, Emily, for people that as far as what they're what's drawing them in? Yes, we actually have um, a comment from Mary, and she said that the facial expressions are also kind of what drew her to it. That's really interesting. Yeah, because for me, um, the facial expressions are definitely an important part, but I guess I, I'm, I'm looking at it first structurally. So um, uh, there's there's a lot going on here. And uh, John Ems was definitely a master of his craft. And, you know, as, as uh, hopefully we get into the discussion, we'll see that. Um, but for me in particular, uh, what really draws me in are uh, these two uh, these two dogs in the beginning, and clearly they're the, they're the largest, right? So they're definitely occupying the biggest part of the space. Um, and uh, and I'm seeing this composition as being, uh, you know, all paintings are two-dimensional, right? Life is three-dimensional, the paintings are two-dimensional. And so when, when we look at paintings, we're looking at things in terms of shapes that interlock uh, and, and shapes that are two-dimensional as well. So we're looking at a triangle or a circle as opposed to a, a pyramid or a sphere, right? Because they're two-dimensional shapes. So in this painting, when we break it down, you have uh, two scalene triangles, um, which, uh, you know, I, I would venture to say these are scalene. There was, there's another really great chat, um, uh, which we're going to share later um, from the museum on, it's a Tumblr post by Anne-Marie Paquette, and she talks about really more at equilaterals uh, triangles, but I see these entire thing as kind of a scalene triangle, meaning that they have uh, this entire grouping that they have unequal sides. And so we have one scalene triangle here, then we have one scalene triangle there. And and uh, let me um, I'm gonna move, oops, hold on, I got a little ahead of myself. So that's the first one, right? So this is the first triangle, the first grouping of, of, um, of dogs. I'm gonna have to move this over a little bit so I can, okay. <laughs> All right, so that's that's the first grouping. So I, I think everybody, that's pretty easy to see, right? This grouping of dogs. Um, and then we have, oops, that's not, sorry, shouldn't have happened there. Let me back out for there for one second. I'm gonna have to stop sharing and go back to my, okay. Okay, don't know why that happened. All right. Okay, it's doing it again. <laughs> okay, hold on, stop share. Okay, technology. All right, apparently I'm touching the wrong thing. Let's see. Let me see if I can just go through here. No, okay, give me one, one second. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my, um, I know what's going on. I, I have an, another demo camera. So if you just give me a second, I'm going to um, disactivate that. Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll have it set up later. Okay, so this is the second. Um, I'm going to have to go back, I think, and share again. Sorry guys, bear with me for a second. Can you see this? Yes. Oh, you can see, you can see the, okay, fantastic, good. No, I see you, I oh, see you. Oh, you see me, okay. Let me go back to the screen, um, full screen, oops, hold on. Okay, <laughs> hold on, sorry guys. You're just seeing me, right? I have to yes. share. Okay, so let me get back to here and let me go to, as. Okay, hold on. There we go. Okay, sorry guys. All right. Okay, we got it now. <laughs> All right, so the first was the scalene triangle. The second is this scalene triangle in the background, which is secondary, right? It's secondary both in size and uh, in value, which we'll get into a little bit further. So these are the two main things that are happening. But then because it's a structure, right? It's a building, it's also happening um, within other shapes. So there's like these rectangular shapes that are happening here. And I've labeled them all different colors so you can so you can see the space, but that's clearly it's because they're in an environment, they're in a building. And so you're gonna have these structural forms of the squares um, and, and the rectangles. And so 
those triangular shapes are happening on top of this kind of grid-like shape. But then there's something really, really cool happening here too. Um, are you guys familiar with what's what's called the golden ratio or the golden mean? I am not. Oh, you are not. Okay. Well, the golden ratio and the golden mean is something that naturally occurs in nature. It's like this divine proportion. Even the human body is, is, is we believe, um, created in this way where it's a, it's, a, it's a ratio of one to one point. I have it written down here. One to uh, 1.618. So meaning that you have, you have an area, you have a smaller area that's in relation to a larger area. And when we look at the divine proportion and we the golden ratio and we apply it to his painting, this intersection here directly falls on that um, on that on that golden ratio, which I think is absolutely fantastic. So what that means is that your eye, there's a reason why your eye is drawn to these puppies here in the front, in addition to them being the size that they are, it's because of the composition. So I find that really, you know, very, very exciting. Um, the golden ratio is something that's in everything. So it's in it's in the pyramids, the construction of the pyramids. It's in the Parthenon, even. It's it's you know in the Nautilus shell. So it's it's something that speaks to us on a on a level that we don't even we're not even aware of. Um, but it's 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 just what they call the divine proportions. So uh, John Ems was definitely he was really you know he was really diving into composition here and none of this is arbitrary this is all set up very intentional to lead your eye um so there's another thing going on here there's a lot of these really cool lines uh which you know i can i think i can compare uh let me see if i can put i should be able to show you both at the same time yeah okay so if I um, minimize that, you can see. So there's a lot of these really great lines going through the composition. Um, I'm sorry that that little error, the little message comes up when I when I show you. But these eyes, um, these lines also draw you in specifically to areas of the composition. So you know, if if you notice here, like this line here, back here takes you to this puppy here, right? And this line here takes you to this this pup here. And this line here, which is the golden ratio, right? The golden mean where it's lying there, it takes you to, to this grouping here. And then even all of these diagonals take you into the, the picture. This was very intentional in terms of, of his design making. You know, all of these horizontal lines of the background take you back to, to this guy here. So um, I just love, you know, looking, uh, looking at that and diving in uh, more deeply into these, um, into all of these, uh, uh, aspects of the painting. And the more you look, the more you see, right? So that's really very um, cool. Uh, we have, you know, even, uh, you know, you have these, this line here of the, um, you know, of the, uh, what's the term for that? <laughs> of the, uh, the whip uh, here, you know, leaning up against, against the, uh, the door, you know, uh, um, so all of these lines are just kind of leading you in and they're part of the narrative. Um, uh, so that's really, you know, really exciting. But this is something that um, that uh, John M's like. He kind of, you know, as artists, we kind of gravitate towards a composition. Uh, well, we have our favorites. Like we have the things that are themes that we like diving down into a little bit deeper. And I, when I looked at his work a little bit more, I started finding more evidence of this. So John M's definitely liked triangles. So here's another triangle of a grouping of these dogs. And you know, if you think about it, if you're if you're drawing a grouping of objects, you would find these uh, geometrical arrangements and, and probably the triangle is one of the best ones. It's definitely a very solid, um, domineering, strong uh, shape. So here is this, um, this puppy, uh, or this this painting, I'm going to say puppies a lot today, because that's, that's what our subject is. Uh, let's see. And then um, here's another one. So again, a similar composition to what's happening here. I think you guys can see that. You know, we have uh, we have the strong vertical of this dog here, and then you could say another scaling kind of shape, although probably more a compounded shape, right? Like a a rectangle plus plus the triangle. But but the same kind of thing is happening there. And then also um, happening here as well. So we can see over and over again that, that this is this is a subject matter and, and these like are very similar, right? In terms of the theme that he's just diving in on it. And that's what smart artists do. Smart artists find something that they're really excited about, 
compositionally, thematically, you know, from a narrative point of view, and they just keep diving into it deeper and deeper and deeper and really expressing it, in, you know, as, pop, as, as much as they possibly can, really exploring every aspect of it. And that's what I see him doing here. So um, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, the sketch today that I would like to uh, talk about with you, in my mind, there's two reasons why we do, um, well, there's many reasons why we do what's called a, ma a, ma a master copy. Um, the first reason is because you want to know that technique of the artist. So you're trying to make it look exactly like the work of art because you're trying to get that technique. The other reason is because you're trying to understand composition that then you can pull into your own work. And I think that's very, very powerful. Um, and that's what I've been thinking about more so lately is that secondary aspect. Um, there is something going on here and I'm going to pull, I'm going to pull up my, my sketch now of, uh, Get rid of this guy. We'll just do a comparison. So my sketch, I did a sketch in anticipation because I wasn't sure how far I would get with the sketch here today. And I wanted to convey this, uh, this idea to you that as a, you know, what I'm thinking of with this particular painting is I'm, I'm interested in exploring the structure aspect of the painting and, and what's going on in terms of the value. Now the value, which is what we refer to as what the light and dark areas of, of a painting, that's what we call value as far as art terminology, that is the, it's a main player that's happening here that doesn't get any of the credit. Color gets all the credit, but really it's value that's doing all the work. And you've probably heard this um, said before, but it is so very true. So the value of this painting, the light and dark aspects of it are reinforcing these shapes of the scaling triangles and the grids. Um, so that's what I wanted to explore here is the grouping of of the you know of the value and the structures together and the more that um, you can you can create these shapes with aggregate objects because you're you're adding them all together so all of these guys are all lumped together because they're all receiving the same light source uh, and the same with these dogs in the background we can lump them together because they're all in the same light source so, so that becomes a very powerful thing to explore in in, in our art making uh, and, and then when you create like a, like a, a large shape like this, of um, like the light area of, of this, um, the scaling triangle, we can also, um, uh, we can start exploring, uh, something that, um, an artist that I admire called Zoe Frank, she refers to as barriers and bridges. And this is a really interesting, this is like, to me, very high degree, uh, art making where you start thinking of, um, where, where areas are grouped together and, and they flow together and then where you want um, areas, things to stop, where you want the eye to go. So um, again, kind of what we were talking about with the, with the diagonal lines, you know, so we have this grouping here in the front of the scaling triangle. And I, I tried to keep them kind of all about the same value, but I did add some dark spots um, because these guys do have the dark spots. And the more I look, it's the kind of thing, the more I looked, the more I saw. And like this dark spot here, I apologize for that little, um, I don't know how else to get around that with the, with the cursor, but this dark spot here, uh, it leads your eye immediately. You start seeing all the, the other dark spots. So it's, it's deliberately leading your eye around the composition. Excuse me. And I did not, uh, I did not add in all the dark spots in the background because I, I also kind of wanted to solidify this entire area for us to read it like that. But clearly, you know, this black spot leads you to the black spot. This black spot leads you to the black spot here, which leads you to the black spot here. So that it has kind of almost a circular aspect here uh, leading your eye throughout. And that is like, that's awesome. That's like high level stuff like with art. That's what we want, right? We want, we don't want to bore the artists, I mean, we don't want to bore the viewer. We want, as artists, we want to capture the attention of, um, you know, of, of, our, of our viewers and keep them uh, captivated. And, and, and you do that by drawing your eye uh, around, drawing their eye around the composition. So um, let's, uh, I can stop sharing and uh, I can take any, any questions at this point before we start we start sketching as uh, does anybody have any comments? I just taking it all in like a sponge. <laughs> Fantastic. I see somebody there's something in the chat. 
Emily. Hi, that was me. I just put in oh. the link for our reference oh, okay. image. Um, yeah, if anybody has any, would if anybody would rather um, type out a question or something, just feel free to do that, and I will ask that for you. But yeah. Did that? Um, did anybody disagree with what I said, or did they see anything and anything more that you'd like to discuss with the about the painting? No. Okay. And again, sorry about that. Uh, that I was trying to set everything up so that it would be seamless. So it's going to be a little less seamless. Um, but you know, we'll do that. So what what I'd like to do now is I'm going to. Um, I'm going to set up the camera for the for the demo and then we'll just start we'll start drawing and again it's just it's basically going to be the same idea of. Um, of my drawing my sketch of the painting you know like I said there's two different reasons in my mind, I mean there's many reasons for doing a master copy, but in my mind. Um, the main reasons for doing a master copy are to emulate the technique or to understand the composition and so that's I, I want to focus more on understanding the composition today. Um, and what's what's happening there, and so that's what we're going to explore in the drawing. We're just going to do a pencil drawing. That's it. Like if you have pencils, that's all you need: pencil and paper. Um, but you can certainly, you know, use whatever material you have at hand that you feel comfortable doing. But I want to encourage all of you to do this kind of stuff: to look at compositions, even if you're not an artist. Like just understanding what's happening there um, below the surface is such an empowering thing to be able to to see that, and it really takes you. Uh, takes your understanding and appreciation of the art to a whole different level. So um, let me go ahead and uh, I will um, I'll stop my video just for a second so I can set up the camera here and but I'll be right here so you can you can you can talk to me Emily or anybody else. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we, had, we got a comment in the chat saying you make it sound so easy and effortless. <laughs> oh, I'm so I so appreciate that. I wish the uh, the technical side had been a little bit better, but we'll we'll get that going. All right. Hopefully you can all see. Um, we're going to get rid of this. Let's expand this. All right, so that's going to be what I'm going to be working with here. Can you guys see that? Yes. yes. Okay, fantastic. All right, so for the demo portion, let me just let me just open real quick my iPad, my reference. It's helpful to have that available. Yeah, once again, if anybody needs the reference image, um, I put it in the chat to Zoom. Let me put it on our chat on Facebook real quick. Um, just so everybody has that in front of them. If you don't, like, let me know and I can make sure that gets to you. Okay, so everybody can see me. Hopefully this will, will work out. So what I'm gonna be working with today, I have um, these Pencils, they're called uh, Palomino. They're actually kind of like cult like, like people they have quite the following. This is the Black Wing 502. Um, this was a company that was an American company uh, that was manufacturing pencils like, like up to the 1950s. I think probably a little bit later, maybe to the 1980s. And then they went out of business. But these were pencils that everybody was using, all the illustrators and even Hemingway, like writers, like this is the pencils that they, they liked. And then a Japanese company bought them and uh, brought them back into production. So, so this is like your HB. This is what they call their um, black wing. I think that's 502. And then they have a darker version, which is like your B, right? So I think of um, the HB as your number two in terms of your hardness, right? That's that's how light or darker that is. And then the B, I tend to think of that as the B designation as like black. So that's the way that I separate it in my head um, so that I kind of remember that. So this is just the black wing, that's their darker version. And we can see, you know, what these pencils do. It's helpful to, uh, to do a little, uh, I'll try to do this so I'm not taking up too much of the space, but just kind of test drive your pencils and see, you know, what they can do. So if you do kind of a little value string here like this, you know, so that's that's that one pencil. That's the one that's like the number two pencil. And then here's my darker version of this pencil. And we can see that I can get darker values. And then, and then I even have, you know, if it's not dark enough, I have this uh, Generals layout pencil, extra black. And then let's see what that does. You'll see that that's significantly darker, but those are, you know, some great values um, for working 
you know, in, in terms of these pencils. And then uh, there's also, you know, you could you could work with um, with a charcoal if you wanted to. One of my favorite charcoals is uh, the nitrum, and nitrum is fantastic because it's like um it's like a square. Um, it's compressed charcoal, and you can just sharpen it very simply. I'll do that here to just show you guys. Um, I won't be using that today. But, um, you can use it, but I have I have the other black, so I don't need to. But all you need is one of these sandpaper things like this, which I know everybody gets, right? When you get these kits. Is my audio good, Emily? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Fantastic. Good. Okay. So you just all you have to do is just press it to one side and it'll give you a nice chisel. Do you guys see that? You can see that kind of edge. And so that allows you to kind of um, have more control. Now there are people in the ateliers, right? And um, these great art schools that they have around the world and in New York City that will take um, a razor blade and make them super, super fine and nice and beautiful and pointed. And I think that's great. I don't have the time for that. <laughs> so uh, my, my shortcut is to use um, is to use the sandpaper. And then you have these uh, these blenders, which also come with all the pencil kits, which I'm sure many of you have lying around. And you're like, what do I do that? What do I use that for? These are great. They're, um, I think the term is tortillon. I'm, I might be mispronouncing that, but these are great for kind of smoothing things over. So you can see that you can just kind of smooth over an area, a transition, make it softer, make an edge turn a little bit better. Um, so I use this both with my charcoal and, and with my, um, in fact, you see I have it labeled. This one's for charcoal, supposedly, but I'll end up messing it up <laughs> and using it for both. Um, and then I use these um, uh, kneaded erasers, which, um, oh my gosh, um, I'm trying to think of all the term, terminology that people have, but these are great erasers. They come like in a little block and you just have to you just have to work on them and knead them together. And what's great about them is that they uh, they um, self-clean, right? The more that you knead it, like a little piece of clay, it's probably also good for those people that have like, you know, those, what are those like, do you guys remember those spin widget things that everybody was doing? This would probably even be a supplement for that, right? You just sit there and, um, and play with it. Um, but it's a great, a great tool. It doesn't really mark up your uh, paper. It's really, um, really gentle in terms of lifting up marks from your paper. So, okay, now let's get into the demo. And um, what I would do, I'm gonna try to try to get this within camera range. So I'm gonna um, make it up, make it rather high. Let's see how far over I can go. I can probably go about there to remind you when you have these demos, um, I'm looking down into the screen, so it's kind of I have something in my way. So it's not it's not the the best angle for drawing, but it's the best angle for viewing for you guys. So that's why I'm doing. So I have my you know I have my rectangle. I'm thinking about my aspect ratio, which means like how large, how wide it is to the to the you know uh, how wide it is to to its height. I want that to be similar. And that's kind of the first thing I'm thinking about. And then um, I really want, since I'm thinking abstractly here about the about the composition, I'm thinking about this division that we have going on. And you know, that that area here with the wall and the puppies, you know, we have that beautiful golden ratio. It's kind of something I'm gonna just arbitrarily kind of put something here. This is how I'm gonna divide it up. And of course, we're working with pencil. So if it doesn't. If you don't get it right the first time around, that's absolutely fine. Just move it. So the first thing I'm doing is setting up that structural line because that's going to help me kind of find a landmark. And then I also like to put this horizontal line here of where um, these other puppies are going to be happening, and and then also break down the space here with it with that door. And that starts giving me some information, you know, right off the bat. Um, and then you know, and I, and I can make what's called little tick marks. That's that's the term for like just a little indication of where things start and stop. Think in terms of your. This is a really important thing, guys. Um, your negative space. I don't know how many of you guys think when you're drawing in terms of your negative space, but that is so important. It's like a superpower. So what do I mean by that? So here, let's. Uh, I'll I'll draw the um, the door uh, really quickly. So I have a, a door here and. You know, you can get only so far with looking at what the object itself is. 
But then if you need more information, look to what the area just next to it, just adjacent to that, that's the negative space. So in order to get this, this angle accurately, I'm looking, um, probably that's not as accurate as it could be, um, I'm looking at the negative space outside that door. And so that's what I mean. So then this area here uh, becomes important, this, this shape here. And that's what I mean by that negative space. So I'm always paying attention to these little things. I go back and forth between drawing the object and then drawing what's around it. And that's super important because if you draw, you know, if you draw what's around it, if you can't get the object itself and you start drawing what's around it, you will by de facto get to the object itself because there's no way that you could draw what's around it and not draw the object itself. So that's a super cool little trick. Um, so I'm just kind of, you know, just, just sketching some things here in. All right, so we have the door, and then the next, then the next thing is I'm going to, you know, pay attention to. I'm looking at that negative space here in the corner. Wish I could do a split screen. That probably would have been a good idea because you can't see that right now. Um, you know what? Let me uh, let me hold up. Let me see. Let me stop real quick, and I'll see if I can if I can share both at the same time. Would that be helpful, Emily? Uh, yes, I mean, if you can, if that's if you can, are able to do that, I think that would be helpful. Okay, great. Yeah, because I just realized I apologize for that. Just realized oh. that I'm not. Okay, so um, share a screen. Let's see if it allows me to do both. Well, I think if I just share the whole screen. It should let me. So uh, what I'll do is maybe I'll get out of this. There we go. I'll just make this smaller, guys. So that should enable me to do it. Let me move this over. And then I just have to go um, in here real quick. Sorry about that. That's totally fine. OK. All right, everything wants to go big screen, not full screen. No. There we go. All right. Okay. So can you guys see? You can. Yeah. You guys can see this and that. All right. Great. Let's yeah. see how big I can get. I think that's about as big as I'm going to be able to to get it. But hopefully this will make a little bit more sense. <laughs> so, all right. Now, now I'll continue. All right. So let me know if I'm buffering or anything like that. Um, so where were we? So now we're going to start with drawing uh, that that big puppy. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, obviously the placement of things. That's that's the aspect of this drawing that I'm thinking about right now is just placement because the composition is what I'm studying. So, um, you know, I'm looking at my door here that I've drawn, and then uh, the height of that dog is not quite as high. So, you know, I'm going to put a tick mark here for the beginning of where he's going to be, and uh, and then I know that the other dog that's next to him is also even smaller than he is. So I'm, I'm you know, tentatively going to put something like that. And then you just start roughing it in. So now um, I have this shape and he himself, this big dog is kind of a triangular kind of shape. Um, you know, I'm going to just put a geometric placeholder for the time being of where I want it, where I want him to go. And, I, you know, we'll refine that, but it's just kind of a geometric uh, shape. Um, and uh, same thing here with this dog. And this is important how he's leaning into this, that gesture, how he's leaning into that post. So again, I just want to do kind of a geometric shape for placement because I want to make sure that I get everything in there. So uh, this is what I'm going to do for right now. Put the dog, dog's paws that'll end there. This dog's paws will end here. I'm just making little notes to myself. Uh, and then this, this area here is going to be important if I have to extend this a little bit, obviously, we can, you know, we're artists here, we'll just use our artistic license, pull that out, you know. Um, so, it's a mom joke. Um, I'm going to 
work on this guy here. He's going to occupy a bit of space. So I want to make sure that I have that space available. And now that I see, um, I might have to move things over a little bit. So maybe the door is taking up a little bit too much space in order to get all of that in. Uh, so we should probably, I need to get another puppy in here, another puppy space. So I'll just put in a placeholder here. And again, in the beginning, you know, it, it doesn't look like much. You're just kind of like, you know, you're not making art in the beginning. You're just kind of uh, sketching things in and that's okay. And that's exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You go from shapes to then dialing in and dialing in more and more and more. So I'm going to put another placeholder there of this head. And then just kind of let's see how that works out in terms of that shape. Let's see if I have to add a little bit. Yeah, I'm going to have to think I'm going to have to extend that. Hopefully I can get that in. I'm going to move this a little bit. Okay, that's better. Anybody have any questions while I'm drawing this? Feel free to ask. I'd also love to hear what you guys are doing when you go to the sketch. What is your area of concentration? Yeah, if anybody would like to um, maybe show show their sketches, what they've done so far to ask any questions or anything, please feel free. Um, yeah, again, if you have any questions, feel free to put anything in the chat. Are you guys all working in pencil when you go to the Sunday sketch? Yes. Yes. And are you looking, are you after the likeness? What are you, what are you sketching when you go there? What, what's your area of interest? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more fascinated at what you're doing that I, like I kind of started out, but now I'm just watching you. <laughs> I'm like okay. taking it in. But I'm here. Okay. I'm, I started, but now I'm just watching. Okay, good. All right. Well, fantastic. Okay. So I'm, I'm still, you know, trying to make sure that I get all my little shapes in here and, you know, placement, the placement is so important. And that's why I did, I went ahead and I did one first because, you know, this, it takes time to, to certainly, you know, do this. So what we have, um, you know, we have this, I think, Terrier, is that what he, what he was? We have this guy, this beautiful gesture there. And then, um, so now the next thing of, of interest here for me is I'm thinking about you know, the placement of, you know, the next dogs. Um, so, you know, this may or may not be the, the right placement. If it's not, you know, just move it. It's not, this isn't rocket science here. <laughs> it's just, you know, if it's wrong, you just move it. So again, here's another triangle. So I'm gonna, for the placeholder right now, I'm going to put, put them here like this. Um, and then this guy, then there's this beautiful hound here. I just love that position. Like he's just so languid and I mean, almost like a classical, you know, uh, nude, you know, like in a, a nymph, like in the woods, kind of the way the dog is just languidly lying here, looking up at the, at the, the main dog there in that area. So I'm just going to, you know, maybe indicate where that possibly could be. We have a, a comment in the Zoom chat that says, my focus is watching and trying not to laugh at my version. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> I love that. That's a great comment. <laughs> okay. So, and what's, you know, it's a really, it's an interesting experience drawing here with the camera in my way. You know, I, I'm trying to, because normally I wouldn't, wouldn't be doing that. I'm doing like this delicate dance in the background that you're not seeing. Well, maybe you are. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> um, all right, so just kind of gritting things up. And then I'll tell you something that is, all right, so now, now I can start thinking about grouping all these guys together. 
Um, I do have one last shape in here that I need to get in and that's this other dog. I'm always thinking in terms of, you know, the placement, all this stuff can, you know, can change as, you know, as we go. It's helpful to think in terms of planes, you know, when you're drawing geometric shapes. Um, might be moving that a little bit more, but let me make an indication of his ears a little bit. Okay. And then, uh, and then just beginning to get some of that gesture. So he's got this, you know, beautiful gesture here with his leg. And again, you know, things can move. So we're not, we're not wedded to anything just yet. But it, what's helpful now is then to start thinking about the value structure. So now that I have this stuff kind of laid out, you know, I think of it as like, um, I don't know how many of you guys wear glasses. I certainly do. And when you wear glasses, you go and you get a vision exam and you sit in that chair and they put all of these like lenses in front of your eye. And, you know, I think of art a lot like that, that you have these lenses that you're viewing everything through. So in the beginning, you know, we're, we're thinking structurally, we're thinking about geometric shapes and placements. And then there's a time where you have to shift your focus you have to start looking at things a little bit differently. And so that we're getting to that period now. So um, I might have done that, not quite right, but the point is, is I'm trying to get to those big shapes, to the scaling shapes that we talked about. So now I'm gonna start veiling in. So now we're shifting, we're gonna use a different lens uh, in terms of our mind's eye, and we're gonna start what's called veiling in, and that's where you're laying down a value. So I want this whole area in the background to be dark. And that's where the drama starts happening, right? And this is called a veil when you just lay this in. Uh, and, and then you can use that time to, again, like the negative space and the positive space, you can use that veiling in to redefine your edges. So now, you know, now I'm looking at these, this edge here of this dog and where he intersects with this other dog um, and trying to get that down more accurately. And you're really kind of, you're just fine tuning as you, you go along, you have these you know, big shapes and you just break them down further and further and further. All right, so there's kind of the indication of that guy. I might pull this, let me see, this guy's looking kind of wee, um, tiny. Pull this down further. So if I do that, I'm going to have to pull the entire bottom part further because that's okay. Just as long as the proportions are right. So yeah, so we can see here that um, the space between the paws and the bottom of the canvas is much, much greater. There's more space there. So I can pull this out and that will give me more space. Okay, so you just continue and then, you know, since I've done that, now I have to reassess and I have to go back and I have to say, okay, well, we know that this door needs to hit here at the very edge of my canvas, my, of my composition. So it needs to be more like that kind of shape because that's what the negative shape, this is a, I don't know, what's the term for that, rhomboid, <laughs> rhombus? Um, I'm more of an algebra girl, so <laughs> uh, let me get, um, and then putting in some of the background details helps with my drawing. So, you know, this, this spacing here between the dog and that door frame um, helps me to start seeing things bigger in terms of grouping. And then now I can move this dog just slightly, you know, his head, he's the big, he's the main guy. He's about same height as, um, as the dog in the background there. So, you know, I can, I can put him in there and I'll often just kind of, you know, do a little bit of a circle to indicate the head and then I'll go in with a plane. And so, you know, like the side of the head, 
I'm trying to find that shape. And that's literally what I think of it as. I'm, I'm looking at that big overall shape of the head with the ears and kind of thinking of it as, um, you know, like a diamond with different facets. And then he's got this beautiful chest that comes out here. And I can see already that I also need, have, I'll need to move that door frame a little bit because that's not quite right, the lining of that. But, you know, this is like if you're really fine tuning things. So then his leg goes down like this. And that plane allowed me to get that line in. And so I'm thinking in terms of those planes. And hopefully this isn't too um, simplistic in terms of an explanation. So I'm trying to be mindful that not everybody has the same um, or education or, you know, same, same experience artistically. But hopefully you all are um, getting something. <laughs> I think you're explaining it really, really well. Actually, I have a question for you. Um, how, do you how do you find um, doing a practice like this? How do you find that this helps you with your, your art that you create? Oh, well, that's a great question, Emily. So I, I am very much thinking right now, I'm doing, um, I'm working bigger these days. I have a five foot canvas that's behind me that uh, is going to be part of my, uh, I have this series called the farm series. You can see it on my website and they're feed sacks from, you know, from a neighbor's farm from Faith Lake of Mustard Hill, um, Faith Lake of Mustard Seed Farm, up, right up right up the way from, from where I am. And, uh, you know, I, I did these paintings on site and, um, you know, they were much smaller. And, you know, I'm thinking now, you know, when you think, when you paint big, you really start thinking about composition. It's really uh, such a, you know, such a big part of, of the painting. And so I'm really looking at master uh, paintings that I can, you know, get that big theatrical effect. And that's what you get from these big paintings. And in order to do that, you really have to kind of study composition. And so, that's what I'm, you know, that's, that's what this does for me. So while I'm drawing this and I'm thinking about shapes in my own painting uh, that I have behind me that, you know, I can show you guys um, here. Uh, let, me, let me show you real quick. I have, so just to show you, because just because it's like, so hopefully you, you can see that. So these are block studies of what uh, I'm going to do for my large painting. And one idea that I have is to do just simply in blues and it's it's a nocturnal it's a moonscape of these feed sacks from the series that i have and i'm i am thinking these big archetypes of shape you know uh, this triangular shape these you know rectangles within within the composition so it very much tracks with, with what um with what i'm doing so hopefully um hopefully that kind of explains your question there emily yeah, definitely. I think that's that's amazing. And if anyone's interested in seeing more of your artwork, we do have a link to your website on our events page. Um, but I can also, um, again, put that in the comments if anyone's interested. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. So I think I think it's it's just super important to look at, you know, and then also as artists, um, yeah, mangled that proportion, but. Um, as artists, you know, we are what we eat, right? Like even as people, right? So if you're sitting there, you're only seeing artwork on Facebook and, um, and Instagram, you're really missing a lot. You're missing on getting your aesthetic and you get your aesthetic from museums. You get your aesthetic from seeing work in person. That's so important as a painter, as an artist, we have to see work in person, not just the digital image of it. The digital image is great for promotion, you know? Um, and for some things for becoming aware of you know, of um, other artists maybe and what they're doing, but you really need to see artwork in person. You need to see how um, how it lines up, you know, how the textural aspect of it, like what's going on to kind of break down, you know, to inform your own practice. And, you, you know, if you're, if you're not doing that, if you don't have a regular practice of seeing other work and other, you know, work at, at a master level, you know, you're just not feeding yourself artistically. You know, I think that's that's my opinion. So, um, stop scrolling. <laughs> Get off of Instagram every once in a while and go to the museum. And this museum here, um, you know, our museum at the National Sporting Library and Museum is such a gem. You know, uh, I'm I'm a big fan. You know, I lived, as I said, in Luckett's, 
And um, it's one of my joys for me is to be able to go to the museum and to see like really high caliber work um, of, you know, like I think the very first exhibit I saw there was uh, an equestrian themed exhibit and there were, there were Degas, you know? Um, and it was just amazing <laughs> to be able to see that like right here in Loudoun County, Virginia, I didn't even have to go to DC. So I can't say enough things about how wonderful this museum is and I hope you all support the museum when they go um, become a member and um, go to the sketches, go to the sketches and sketch in person. So I don't, you know, I'm thinking as I'm drawing this, you know, I want to get things accurate, but at the same time, I don't want to spend too much time. Uh, so, you know, I'll go back and forth between working one area, kind of abandoning other areas till I get, you know, closer to what, uh, what I want. And then because I'm thinking abstractly, I'm not, I'm not too concerned about, you know, getting, uh, getting a likeness, you know, I'm more about the proportions. That's really what, um, what I'm thinking about there. So I'm happy, you know, for whatever, for, for now, um, there's a lot of interesting things happening with this painting, like, you know, on the side here. So, you know, this, um, you know, you have the shadow here, um, you know, which to me kind of almost looks like a cat actually, or like a, um, Oh, what uh, was a Doberman Pinscher or something like? It just looks like a different kind of dad or Batman. I don't know. You can kind of, you, could, you know, like when you see shapes in the, in the, you know, in the, um, in clouds, you know, you start seeing kind of different things. But that to me kind of looks almost like the silhouette of Batman. But it's interesting what's happening here. So then, then Ems does, you know, he puts this like, there's like this dark area here. You know, um, to bring your eye, I think, back to here, we were talking about the different spots. And then there's this, there's this, like, the corner of the room, right, is happening here. And why does he put that there? He puts that there to stop the eye from traveling out of the painting, to keep you back here. So to keep you ping-ponging through, um, through the composition, which is just, you know, brilliant. I mean, this is like master class level stuff, guys. So um, I definitely would recommend that you download um, you know, you download this piece and, and you do your own um, sketch sketch of it because there, there is just so much to see and, and understand. Um, all right, so now I'm thinking about, you know, once I get like one area, so then the other, the other lens that I think about when I'm uh, working is these puzzle shapes. Now, in my classes, I always talk about um, how what we're doing as artists is, is basically we're working with like these great big puzzles like um, like toddlers, you know, like those really big pieces and then you're kind of putting everything together. So I'm using my superpower of my negative space to help me figure out the placement of things. So um, even though I can see that this is off, um, you know, like this this area, this negative space should should be much, should not be, should not be as big as what that is there. But all of this helps me um, fine tune. I don't know how much I will come out so that I want to improve upon. But then I can see now that my feet are not exactly in the right place. So now I need to move them over. And so I'm always thinking about these interlocking pieces and how they fit together. Hey, Suzanne, I don't mean to interrupt. I just want to let you know that um, we're a few minutes till the end. Um, it's okay if we go a little bit over it. Okay, great. Thank you. That's last time, guys, when I did this, I had no clue. So I appreciate Emily, you telling me. Yeah, that's no problem. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? I'll work a little bit more on this and see if I can get a little bit more. But this was that's why I did my 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 sketch. Let me see. Um, maybe I'll just pull that up and we'll talk about it a little bit more. Because it does it does take time to kind of get all of this in, in place. Is this um, is this kind of a practice that you've been doing since you started um, getting really interested in art, or is it something that like a skill you kind of built up um, along the way? The sketching from master painting to me. Yeah, yeah. That's something that uh, you know I. Um, yeah, I think I've always done that. I think you know as um, oh gosh, as, as children we probably have all drawn. Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, you know, like there's certain things that, you know, that everybody kind of gets into and starts drawing. Um, so it's always kind of been there, but even more so uh, when I became um, much more interested 
in um, achieving a certain level of realism in my work. I just found that, you know, you know, going directly to the source is really the greatest way of achieving that, you know, and so um, I also uh, was a copyist at the National Gallery of, of Art for a little bit. And of those of you who live in the area, that's a fantastic program. Um, do you allow copying um, in oil, uh, like in painting in person? Emily, do you know that if there's a program set up at the museum? Um, we do allow people to come in and sketch um, sketch from the art as long as we don't uh, we don't have any materials that will leave any residue, so no painting or um, charcoal, but like color or pencils are completely fine. Um, but yeah, you, anyone's um, completely free to come in and sketch from the work that we have. Okay, because the National Gallery they do have a program that allows you, and you probably have seen artists there, guys. Um, you know, painting from the collection. And they're really, they've been doing that since the inception of the museum, um, but it's, it's very formal. Like you have to apply and uh, you get a permit and then you can only, you know, you can only paint from um, a painting in their permanent collection. And then it has to be, your, your canvas has to be, oh, I can't remember now. I think it's like, you know, uh, two to four inches shorter in each dimension or larger than the original because, um, when they began the program, there was somebody who was so good that, you know, he wasn't purposely trying to sell them as originals, but other people would get his work and then they would show up in um, antique stores in the area and uh, be oh, wow. off as originals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now the National Gallery has like, you know, you have to have a stamp on your, your canvas, etc. you know, but it is such an important part of, um, uh, you know, of, of, of practice, I really would encourage everybody to do that. And, uh, and, you know, even, even just doing it in, in pencil or, you know, now there's so many, um, you know, there's so, so many, you could just Google high res file, you know, or high res image of whatever painting or artist that you're interested in. And, uh, and then download the picture and then, you know, do the, um, do the copy. But um, here, I'm going to, I'll stop sharing that so we can, um, hopefully that you guys got a little bit of a taste there. Um, yeah, that was, that was really cool. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so what was I saying? Um, yeah, I just highly recommend just learning as much as possible. I really feel like as an artist, it's a lifelong pursuit. Uh, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner and I have a couple books to suggest to you guys as well, if, if you're interested in this further. Um, this is a wonderful book uh, by William V. Dunning. It's called Changing Images of Pictorial Space. And you can find this on Amazon. Really great book about just the history of the pictorial image from the beginning. I, I mean, like we're talking, you know, um, uh, Masaccio and you know 15th century you know all the way to now and and it, what's happening there in terms of modernism and how you know we went from a very flat um, 2D surface to you know the the Renaissance perspective which was like a very 3D perspective and then and then um, modern day took it right back to a flat surface again so kind of the evolution of that so this is a really uh, great book and then there's another one by a guy named David Friend and a friend of mine <laughs> recommended this one and we picked it up and this one you can get um you know in the used bookstores composition a painter's guide to basic problems and solutions and i'll give all of this to emily um so that you guys can have it too but it has really great exercises um uh, to help you see compositionally what's what's happening i'm wondering if um i can pull something up like in you know just master paintings you'll 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 start seeing these themes of the of the triangle the circle the square the aggregate of all these objects especially like in a rembrandt painting like you'll see it in master paintings a lot and uh, that's just it's something really fun to be kind of a detective and just sleuth all of this out and then as an artist just take it all in so um i think i've kind of hit all of my talking points um uh in terms of um I do, if anybody's interested, I, I can mention the names of the other paintings that, that I showed there of John M's. And uh, from what I saw, he was just a really brilliant uh, painter. It looked like he studied formally for a long time. Like I, I was looking at the dates, I should have written it down, but it, I feel like it was like seven years of formal training. So like, you know, a, a four-year degree plus a master's degree or something. And then of course he was 
he had a, a parent who was an artist. So um, he had a lot to draw upon and uh, his work is very sought after. And I don't know how many, uh, do you know, Emily, how many you have in the, in the collection of his work? We have, um, this one is our main one. We do have one smaller one as well. Okay. Oh, great. Is that out? Is it out for permanent display? I think, uh, let me double check and see which one it is. Um, it's um, Rombo, it's E-M-M-S. It's pronounced M's, like M&M's. That's how I think of it. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> Oh, I can't hear you now. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, we have actually four. So I was looking at our um, online catalog. We have um, one called Gone to Ground, a gray hunter with foxhounds and a terrier. And um, we do have that one out oh, and displayed. Great. Can, can you come and make an appointment to see other things that aren't on display? Like, how does that work? Like, do you have a similar policy to the National Gallery? Um, so I don't, I don't think we necessarily... Um, so we can definitely, if you'd like to book a tour, if anyone's ever interested in booking a tour, um, if you just email me, um, my, my email is up on the event webpage. Um, it's also up on the website um, and we can get a tour set up for you. Um, so we can, so then you can see in person the two M's that we have displayed. In terms of seeing the ones that we don't have displayed, um, that's something where I could talk to our curator, Claudia, um, or our collections manager, Lauren, as well about that. Um, but yeah, definitely. I think I think that's one of the really cool things about programs like this, where you can learn more about composition, is because I think when you go and see that painting right in front of you, it changes the way that you view it, rather than you know, kind of just looking at it and loving it, but not exactly knowing the technical reason why. And so yeah. I think this is really cool. Yeah, it's so important to to understand art, you know, and to see it in person. That's such a big deal. And so I, I'm so glad that you guys are still open. What what's going on with your viewing hours? Like, is is that still you can just come or do you have to, you know, I think you told me that you don't have to make an appointment anymore to come to you yep. work. Yeah, you no longer have to uh, make an appointment or set up a ticket um, ahead of time. Our hours are from thir uh, Thursday through Sunday, uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, but we just like ask that we wear all wear masks. Um, but otherwise, we're, we're open as usual. Fantastic. Yeah. Good. Well, there's a, I saw there's a ro Rosa Bonheur. Um, Bunner um, painting that you uh, that you I don't know if you recently acquired it with the lion's heads. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah, is that, one, is that one up or is that something that you'd have to make an appointment to see? No, that one's up. We have that one up in um, one of our galleries in the museum. So, oh, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Definitely want to come back yeah. and see that. Yeah, I encourage anyone to go through our website. We have um, some of our artwork. You can search through our artwork on our online catalog. Um, but I encourage anyone to look through that and then kind of come and see what we have. It's really, it's really amazing to see that artwork in person. Yeah. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, everybody. It's been wonderful. I really appreciate your coming and hopefully you got something out of it. And um, great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So appreciate it. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. It was, it was wonderful and it was very informative. Oh, good. I'm thank so glad. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.